Just to close the door. Okay. Not on your way out. You can come back though. No, we have minute takers already. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you want to do in the intro? Or? Yeah, you go ahead. Hmm? You go ahead. Okay. Welcome, everyone. This is the Lake Working Group session at, at ITF 118. Uh, we have note takers who kindly volunteered. I thank uh, Marco and uh, Giovanni for agreeing to take notes. And Stephen will help us out as the Jabber scribe. So uh, we have we have a one hour meeting and the agenda is quite packed. So uh, I propose we get started immediately. So this is an ITF meeting. So please be aware of the note well. It describes the various ITF policies that uh, on the standardization process in the ITF and the contribution. Also, uh, we didn't have any problems with uh, uh, inconsistent behavior in, uh, in this working group, so I'll just skip this slide, but in, otherwise, please behave. So for the newcomers among us, please make sure to sign into the session using the Miteco Lite client or your laptop. Uh, and use the Miteco to join the mic queue, uh, and please keep audio and video off if not using the on-site version. Uh, we don't have too many uh, on, uh, remote participants, but uh, that I see, I think most of the folks are here. So, but in case also same guidelines follow for the remote participants, please join the queue and we, uh, before speaking. So here are a couple of links for the resources uh, of this meeting. You can find the agenda, the proposed agenda, uh, the Miteco link, and the minutes where we will be taking notes. So on the, this is a status update. So the ad hoc draft has been uh, shipped, approved by the ISG on 28 August 2023. It is currently in the RFC editor queue. There has been a little setback, but we will be discussing this during the uh, ad, hoc, uh, ad hoc update slot. Uh, same thing for the draft traces. Uh, it was approved by the ISG on 22nd of September. Uh, it is currently in the RFC editor queue, and it was held back uh, temporarily because of the setback with ad hoc. Uh, we have adopted uh, draft uh, Lake Odds, uh, the 00 version, on 18th of October. And we will be hearing this time uh, some implementer feedback, some first implementer feedback on this draft. And other than that, we had uh, two, or if I count differently, three independent 00 submissions uh, that we'll be discussing in this meeting. So three is because the one of the drafts was submitted as a core draft, and I think it relates very much to Lake, and we will be discussing it in this meeting as well. So the proposed agenda is uh, as follows. So we will first be starting with the chartered items, uh, with the adopted items, I'm sorry. Uh, the ad hoc, uh, short updates on the ad hoc and the traces draft, the implementer feedback on the odds draft, and then we will start with the independent, uh, with independent submissions uh, that are led by Marco and Christian. Does anyone want to bash this agenda? No, I hear no objections. So I propose we start with the meeting then. And the first presenter will be Joran. Okay. Hello. Okay. I'll be switching slides. So just let me know when you want to next time. Okay. Thanks. So hello, everybody. I'm Joran Selander. I'm going to present the last updates on ad hoc traces. Um, so uh, as um, Alisha already told us, this is essentially shipped, but um, there's been some changes since the last meeting. So next slide, please. So there are two new versions of ad hoc and three new versions of traces. 
and uh, in version 21 of Edwok, we essentially captured the the uh, ISG comments, and there was some minor update also in in version 22, uh, which was approved and sent to the RFC editor. And uh, yeah, I, I have a separate slide on the Anna discussion. So if you were blinking last week, you might have noticed that or missed that we actually moved from RFC editor state back to ISG state and now in RFC editor again. And the traces um, 06 was essentially capturing the ISG comments. We added some invalid traces and I'll talk more about that in section seven and uh, in version seven, sorry. And then there is a minor update uh, which was sent to the, to the RFC editor. Next slide. So these are essentially the comments from, from ISG that, that made a, uh, were a main change or a notable change to the draft. There is now a recommendation to use chain rather than bag to simplify for constrained implementations. Uh, there is a change in the use of English it's not necessarily, it's not a requirement, it's more a recommendation. Um, there were a lot of qu comments about transport requirements and we tried to capture those. And then the rest related to security considerations. There is now some more text about uh, symmetric crypto and the implications, post quantum implications. There is, uh, the, there used to be a recommendation about threat model, which is now changed from a capital should to a lowercase should. There is some uh, clarifications on denial of service mitigations and their limitations and a little shuffling of text between sections. So these were the changes in ad hoc 21. The next slide uh, was a minor update where we finally added the recommendation about transport, again, coming from ISG's review. And then we bring on to the tra next slide, traces. No, sorry. OK, so this was at 22. And then that was shipped to the RFC editor. And it's back again at the RFC editor. So you don't need to read this slide. Actually, there's not, no change. But I was asked to ex explain what happened. and. What happened was basically a, de a detection of an overlap in IANA registrations. So ad hoc is defining two new COSA header maps. So these are defined to be able to use Zebra Web Tokens and Zebra Web Token claim sets as authentication credentials. So to identify those, um, since ad hoc is using COSI to identify credentials, we needed to have register those. Um, those values as COSI header maps. And they, they are called KCWT and KCCS. And now there is another draft in COSI who is also defining um, a COSI header map for CCS. And that's generic. There is no, no restriction to the contents, um, whereas KCS require that there is a a CNF claim containing a COSI key. So it's essentially a credential of some sort. And uh, to avoid the overlap, uh, the first expert uh, requested us to make the ad hoc registration, which was first, more generic. And that was the point when ad hoc was taken out of the RFC editor's queue to, pen, to uh, make sure that this, um, this was taken into account. And then there was a second expert saying that, well, yes, they are the same in the sense of syntax, but there's a different semantics. So they should not be uh, registered with, with one single um, CBOR header map. So this is my understanding of the state. And, and from an ad hoc point of view, I think this is clear that there will not be any change to ad hoc. So this goes back to the RFC editor. And I don't know if there's anyone who want to add what is going on on the on the COSI side, or maybe that's something brought up we bring up in the COSI working group meeting. So, Mike. Yeah, I'll just say that there's been 
Easeful Discussions with Karsten Borman, who's the second uh, designated expert. And he gave us good feedback on the draft and it improved our draft and it doesn't change the lake draft. And I'm just here to, if there's any questions, but I'm fine with this outcome. Cool. <clears throat> good stuff. Uh, so, so I think, in fact, we have to ask Paul to send a mail to the RFC editor to, to put it back in their queue. So we're, uh, barring any objection, and I don't see any. Uh, so Paul, could you do that, please? So Paul says yes. So it should, it should be in the, in the new stage, or back into the RFC editor stage shortly. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so that was oh, the... I'm sorry, thanks to also to the other folks who got in a huddle on Sunday, I think, as well, just to make sure this was all good. So thank you. OK, next slide. Oh, and then we had the traces document. So we did a um, major update in version 6, which was aligned with, it was a minor change to the specification, but all the test vectors had to be, um, had to be re recalculated. It was a large work by Marco mainly. And then there were uh, follow-up with interop tests between three different implementations. Both uh, test vectors are now verified by two independent implementations. And we have added Malisha as a co-author. So now all implement implementers are authors of this draft. All in implementers involved in the interop test, I should say. And then there were some clarifications and editorials. Uh, next slide. So in version seven, there was another change introduced which we realized pretty late, but we uh, agreed what would be very useful. And that's that we also, instead of just having the positive test vectors, we also include some invalid messages so that uh, where the implementation should detect and react with an abort. So there's a new section with these. Uh, there are three subsections. One is looking at CDDL, essentially, I mean, ad hoc is, Ad hoc messages are CBOR sequences, so they are defined by CDDL. And then there are some optimizations as well, which are mandatory to use. And so it's kind of easy to detect whether you have a, a compliant CDDL or not. And there are some cases where, where you might make mistakes. So, so that's included. And then there is a second subsection looking at uh, crypto-related errors, if you have the wrong length of Mac or if you're not doing the point validation or yeah so there are a number of, of cases there which was very useful because we found a few bugs in the existing implementations and then there's a third subsection looking at non-deterministic CBOR so ad hoc is requiring the sender to produce deterministic CBOR and uh, there are some examples of non-deterministic CBOR which you could check and see if uh, how, how your implementation react on. And there was also, yes, yeah, some, some minor things about normative text. This is a traces, this is a test vector document. You could ask, why do you need normative text at all? But there is actually one normative statement saying that you must not use the private keys in this document. So that's the reason why there is normative text in this. And some security references were updated. Uh, next slide, please. And then the final touch where we move, removed one of the valid traces because um, although ad hoc is specifying the use of deterministic CBOR, it is, the receiver may be uh, a little bit forgiving because there is not a security issue related. For example, and that was this, tr this trace here, in case you're sending um, a map which contains the identifiers of the uh, credentials that you're using, or rather various identifications of a given credential, then the order of those identifiers is not a security issue. But according to deterministic CBOR, you're supposed to order them in a lexicographical order. So that is a non-issue from an, from an ad hoc point of view, but it's, it's actually non-deterministic CBOR. So you're not supposed to send, but uh, we can accept. You, it's, it's not a problem if you handle a message which has this non-lexicographical order in this case. 
so that's the last draft. That's what the one we sent off. And um, that's it. Okay. Any comments or questions? We're expecting none. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Yaron. Thanks. I propose we go for the next presentation. The next presenter is Giovanni Fedraceschi on as an implementer feedback on Lake Oats draft. Hello, everybody. My name is Giovanni, and I will comment on the draft uh, Lake Oats. Uh, we also call it, refer to it as zero touch authorization. And I will be giving uh, implementer feedback. Uh, next slide, please. So to do a recap, uh, we have here uh, three entities, a device, which is constrained, a domain authenticator that can be seen as a gateway, and uh, an enrollment server uh, that also can be thought of as an authorization server, what you prefer. And we use UV and W to refer to them. So the device wants to enroll into a domain over a constrained link. And this enrollment will be assisted by the enrollment server. The device will authenticate with the domain authenticator using ad hoc. And uh, yeah, and then between device, uh, between U and V, we have a constrained network. But between V and W, the network is generally not constrained. Next slide, please. And uh, the thing is that we can uh, use the EAD field from ad hoc to, to, to perform this uh, authorization. So we are basically uh, leveraging the extens extensibility capabilities of ad hoc. So in message one, uh, we have the device sending the location of W so that uh, V can forward the request, which will be a voucher request. Then for the response, uh, the, the voucher will be relayed back to you. Um, next slide. We are doing this on top of an existing implementation, uh, which is ad hoc Rust. It's a microcontroller, microcontroller optimized implementation of ad hoc in Rust. Uh, it doesn't use heap. It, we do inline C boring coding so that we, we don't depend on, on, on external libraries. We have an effort to form a verification in this implementation, which is going on. We support uh, configurable crypto backends, and we also have skeleton for EAD handlers, which we use uh, in, in, the implement, in, the, in the implementation of the zero touch draft that I'm talking today. Next slide. Uh, so for, for what we have done, basically we have the preparation of all the messages that are needed for this to work. Uh, we have validation with test vectors. We support fields for stateless operations, which is basically an optimization where V can just uh, act as a relay of uh, incoming messages. And then W will decide if this message should be uh, allowed or not, or this device should be allowed or not. So we support that. Uh, we also made a change so that in message two, we send cred V by value, which uh, in ad hoc normally it's by reference, uh, especially when we cons consider constrained networks. We also have a mock at W that for now runs alongside V. And we, we, we plan to, to make, I mean, I mean, for to do, we have uh, implementing W and have the whole authenticated communication between V and W. And we plan to do a demo also as next. Next slide, please. So beginning with the actual feedback here. So I start uh, with uh, message two, where we have cred, cred V transported by value. So when we look into the ad hoc specification, in many cases, we have all that the, uh, the, cred, the ID cred, either of initiator or responder, is sent by reference. Uh, this is to reduce the overhead on the message size, but it requires pre-provisioning of credentials in I and R, which is fine. Like we, it's like an optimization that can be done to, to save uh, bytes over the network. 
when we are trying to do this authorization procedure where we want zero touch network join, we need to be more dynamic. So we don't want actually to have pre-provisioning. So we need to send the, creden the full credential by value over the air. And so the comment here is that while the draft uh, addresses that credit V can be sent over the air, that is stated several times in the document, uh, I think that put, there could be a more direct guidance that, for example, I propose that the implementation should support sending credentials by value because uh, I think that could be more upfront in the document because in, this, in, in our implementation specifically, that was a significant uh, change so that we could support these two modes of operations. Uh, and also, I think it would be valuable to add considerations on increasing message sizes, uh, which for a raw public key will be between like bet somewhere around 60 and 90 bytes. Next slide, please. Next, uh, I, I continue talking about message two, and I speak about uh, the processing uh, with respect to cred, cred V. Uh, where the responder, which is V, sends back uh, the credential to the initiator. Uh, so first we, go, we, we make a step back to, to think about the voucher because the voucher is emitted by W and uh, it's, it is calculated by doing ad hoc expand, which is basically a MAC over the parameters of the PRK info and length and the important thing is here is that uh, info contains the credential of V. So uh, what we have here in the end is a, a, a transitional uh, trust because since you trust W, in the end, you will trust the credential of V because the voucher emitted by W, uh, it, it's bound to the credential of V. So in other words, uh, since cred V is considered valid, uh, it, it can be used in the remaining of ad hoc processing. So ma mainly the, the idea here is, is to make it more clear that the voucher will help uh, the device U uh, in trusting the validity of cred V. So that can be inferred by reading the document, but I think it could be uh, stated uh, like in a, maybe in a sentence like saying this, uh, because uh, it, it will be more clear. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is more editorial, uh, where there is the definition of uh, calculating the MAC, and uh, I mean calculating. Uh, so sometimes where the we have the function ad hoc expand called, uh, where we have length. I, I, here I denote length star and length two stars where only length two stars is actually uh, really defined. The other one can be inferred by the size of the initialization vector, but that could be stated uh, explicitly. So that's one thing I noticed while implementing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and here, two questions that are related to the processing of message three. Uh, the first one is with respect to EAD handling, where uh, we can divide uh, in the, from the implementation point of view, we have core ad hoc handling and the handler of the EAD. And, but I think that it may be the case that in receiving message three, we want to trigger the EAD handling after message three. But from an implementation point of view, Either we need uh, an, an EAD tree to be present to trigger that processing of the EAD handling, or we would have to save some state to remember to do that. So maybe, so this is a question, should we have an EAD tree that can be addressed uh, in further discussion? Uh, and the next point is processing of ID cred I, which is normally uh, transferred as a reference from the device to the domain authenticator. Uh, so just to state, this fits in the trust model of trust in first use that probably Mark will mention with uh, his draft of the implementation guidelines. Uh, but what we have here is that since W trusts U, the device, then V also trusts W 
and this should be able to trust you. Uh, so there is again this kind of transitive uh, trust, but the voucher is not bound to the credential of you. So it's not very clear to V if he can trust on the credential of you. So the question is, should it have such a binding or what can we do about it? Or is it really a problem? So I think it's worth discussing. Next slide, please. And as final remarks, uh, I found during the implementation that uh, the ad hoc EAD mechanism uh, actually works well for extensibility. Uh, also the reuse of the primitives of ad hoc, it helps because uh, in the same code base, it was possible to reuse uh, the ad hoc expand functions, for example. So there are some proposed clarifications to the draft, uh, some questions that we can discuss about message tree. And for next steps, we plan to build a demo and uh, interoperability testing would be also very nice. And for this, we need uh, uh, the implementation of AW. Well, we talked uh, to Michael uh, before and maybe he'll, he'll be willing to do that, but we also invite someone, uh, anybody that is interested in helping with that. And that's it, thank you. And you. any questions? So if you, yeah. Yeah, I think thank you very much for, for this careful um, reading. And I think that the clarifications really make makes a lot of sense. Um, in regards to your questions, that I think that's, uh, that's really good input about, for example, the EAD3 there is that, um, so currently there is, there is only um, EAD items for, for message one and message two, but um, the way EADs are defined, it's basically application. Um, a given application can use EADs in, in any message. So if we need to have them for triggering certain actions, then, then yes, we should put them, put them in there. And that probably makes sense in, in, uh, in yeah, as you proposed here. Where, what about the, uh, and about the binding, that's actually a, a thing we haven't really uh, solved yet it's been it's been discussed but we don't have a a solution to that so that's uh, something to put on the issue tracker i think i don't have a straight answer right now good very good comments thank you very much okay thank you okay christian christian i'm so sorry for not joining the queue multiple device failure um so on on the ead3 state i think it should be fine to pass that around in the application because the application will know that it is doing an an auth ex exchange, and it will still know that by the time it is me processing message three. Um, as for the the um, second part, um, I mean, yes, I think I do think kind of we should look into this more deeply. But it's not like this completely trust and trust use. So the ID, uh, the the cred I might not be uh, verified, but it still verifies that the voucher request matches the um, the public key that is used, uh, so the ephemeral key that is used for the exchange. So. We're like we're like not completely out in the in we're we're not completely uh, on in tofu mode. Okay. Yes, we can we can discuss that. So I have one question for you, and I think one for another one. Uh, so the question is: You mentioned that there's some work going on looking at hacks. Yes. If I remember correctly, so that's like an annotated code approach, or not? No, no. We in the beginning it was very restrictive for what kind of Rust we could write, uh -huh. and Malisha did a lot of work uh, with that. But now we have been increasingly being able to write more regular Rust because they are evolving on their side. Okay. So it's like, <clears throat> oh, this week we all supported regular structs instead of just some special kind of struct that is more constrained. Okay, so, so, so I think it'd be useful to, if, if, if you're able to send a mail to the list about the status of that, and you know, not necessarily today, but whenever, whenever there's appropriate. something relevant. Yeah, to, yeah. To yeah I think that would be good to know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other question is maybe more for the authors. Um, What's the like the one sentence description of how how finished this work is? I mean, it's not finished, but you know it's progressing. So you're on. I'm thinking. Uh, so I mean, we this, this has, been, this has been around for a long time, um, and we discussed it a lot. But I mean, Giovanna is doing. Is providing us with good questions here, which means that we haven't thought about some things. Um, so, yeah, 
I, I, I think we need to have uh, at least one iteration more before we can say that we have, we have something that is um, it's completely thought through. Okay, so that means like my... two or three iterations then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. I, suppose, I suppose so. Yeah, no, yeah, just to give people a feel for where we're at. That's, that's, that's great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item is the agenda. Is Marco's uh, individual submission on uh, implementation considerations? Thank you, Alicia. Uh, this is Marco. Uh, this shouldn't really be a surprise. It's just finally a draft, but it's content that has been also presented in the past. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, to recap, during the, the work on the actual log specification, there were um, a number of non-trivial things that kept coming up. It was a right to decide to keep them uh, away from the specification of the core document, but still acknowledging that they were relevant to at some point, document somehow to uh, help implementers to uh, well, make mistakes or waste time thinking over and over the same uh, uh, things. Uh, they're just inevitable points one has to consider at some point when implementing either an application using ad hoc or an ad hoc library, uh, whatever. So it's really about implementer um, <clears throat> guidelines. Um, I presented this at different level, uh, also in previous meetings, interim meetings, uh, that also contributed in the related uh, text now in the charter that I'm um, quoting here. Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, we finally have the document. Uh, it is still about the uh, three main topics that I uh, imagined from the start, organized into uh, one section uh, each. And uh, the first topic is about what to do in case um, the ad hoc session becomes uh, invalid or the key material that was exported from it uh, becomes invalid. Uh, the second one is different uh, trust models that I imagine application or an ad hoc library to take uh, in case of learning new authentication credentials on the fly uh, when running uh, ad hoc. So it's not about already stored and well trusted credentials, it's about new one appearing uh, on the fly. Uh, and the third and most interesting one that apparently was considered already during the hackathon that we just had uh, is about a, a number of site processing uh, steps that are taken, especially about the validation of credentials and the processing of EAD items that are, uh, of course, in the interest of ADOC, but um, it shouldn't be something the actual ADOC protocol um, should worry about and uh, should actually be agnostic of those aspects. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, on the, on the first topic, uh, there is mainly a, only the, the application that has actually a full awareness and visibility of what the, the ad hoc sessions that are ongoing are, are completed and uh, of the key material that uh, got derived from them. Uh, I started to imagine a number of things that can happen and the, the easiest thing also to handle is really uh, an ad hoc session um, has to be uh, purged just because it has become invalid, for example, because the credentials involved there uh, has been revoked on expired. But this is just simple, just push the session and destroy the keys, uh, you're done if you want to run a new session. Um, it's a bit more tricky in case, well, the session remains valid, but uh, for some reason, the, the keys that were exported out of it uh, are not good anymore uh, for a number of reasons, really. Uh, and then there's a caveat, you need to check if those keys have been actually persisted, uh, meaning um, used. There's actually a discussion about that in the ad hoc document itself. Uh, so if that's not the case, um, well, the keys have, haven't really been used and persisted really, so uh, trash them, uh, run ad hoc again. Uh, but if keys were uh, used and good, you may try something better than running ad hoc again altogether, uh, like running a dedicated key update protocol. And for example, we have one um, specific for OSCOR, but that can be others for other uh, kind of security protocols. Uh, as a last result, it, it, none of this can work uh, or there's no support for a lightweight key update, of course, uh, run it again, establish new keys. And, and then there's a third case, which is basically a variant of the second one where uh, not only ad sessions and keys are involved, but also something else like uh, an access token proving uh, access rights that possibly was um, a first enabler uh, to run ad uh, hoc in the first place. Uh, and there you need to check that the uh, access token is also uh, still valid. Uh, otherwise, before taking any other, any other action in the same lines of case two, you need to get a new access token first. And a case in point is uh, a profile for the ACE framework based on ad hoc and OSCOR. 
Next slide, please. And this is the second topic uh, on the trust models for the authentication credentials. Uh, and again, if a credential is stored, uh, is trusted uh, since the storing happened. And of course, this is going to be the case as long as the credential is not revoked, doesn't expire. So this is more about what to do uh, when the peer receives um, a credential during an execution on the test to decide uh, if, if taking it or not. Uh, of course, assuming it is valid, uh, whatever validating the credential means, for example, verifying a chain of signatures for a certificate. Uh, I, I've always seen this um, three rough uh, trust models where, where the first one is the absolutely most strict one. Um, I'm not fine with learning anything on the fly, basically. I want to have the credential uh, already stored. So if you come to me with the credential by valuing the message, uh, well, I validate it, but I, I take it if I have it already. So basically, I'm not fine with learning anything new on the fly. Uh, I call it PKO, just pre knowledge only. Uh, on the second one, it's a bit uh, less strict. Uh, I'm fine with learning uh, something uh, on the fly for example, transported by value, but at least I want to have something relatable to that credential. For example, um, a related uh, identifier. And an example can be I received by value certificate. I don't have it yet, but uh, I have, uh, for example, the hash of that certificate that I stored and I, I received in advance by uh, some trusted party. Uh, and the third one, uh, I call it TOFU, yet is disputable if the name is appropriate for, for this definition that I have in mind, but it's really, I, I'm fine with learning anything new on the fly as long as it is valid, uh, of course. Jonathan. Just a quick comment. So we had a question from, from Giovanna here previously about the OATS draft. So, so this is really more learn on first use rather than trust on first use. So you, you have you get the cred V during message two, and you also get the voucher, and then you can use the voucher to verify uh, cred V. Uh, we ended up talking about that where the peer didn't have anything at all already stored about the credential. And the, the desired behavior was, well, if the credential I received now by value is valid, I'm okay with that. I store it. And we realized validating the voucher was essentially a step uh, in order to validate the credential. But still, it was all about validating the credential. And if valid, it was fine to learn in store. So that was kind of mapped in, in what I thought as TOFU here. Because the peer wasn't storing anything in advance, really. No. But it was... <laughs> It was storing a trust anchor of, in this case, the W, the third trusted third party. And it was deriving keys to verify a Mac, which could only be verified if the credential received in the second message coincided with the credential, the credential vouched for by W. So it's, it, it has a trusted a trust anchor and it's, learning uh, okay maybe not corner but but it, it, it deduces from from that the, that the received credential is the intended party to talk to calling that trust on first use um I, it, it, it might fit with trust on first use but it doesn't fit with always trust an unknown cred because that's not that verification adds more than just trusting the cred as it comes in my mind it can be seen also as case two if um, you extend the definition to admit not only identifiers of that credential, but also credential of further parties used for the validation. I, I was mapping that to case three so far. <laughs> okay. So I'll, we I'll have come John in the queue. <clears throat> Thanks. I, I, I feel. I don't really see how one and two would be like different kinds of the. Uh, trust levels. This seems to be different ways you can build your applications, but they should have identical security while, while three has a different, completely, completely different trust model. So do you mean to merge one and two? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you want to say, but if, if 
in my view, one and two should have identical security properties, like if you implement them correctly. So, but of course, they are quite. There might be quite different passage flows and so on, but uh, I don't know what you want to say. What to do when I see a new credential? So I guess, you know, just in the interest of time, we can, I think we should note this as a thing that needs looking at. Yeah, so maybe some terminology or, or classifications. Okay, uh, next then. Uh... I'll try to rush a bit. Uh, yeah, this is the most interesting part, I think, that we also consider closely during the uh, hackathon as just to reiterate that the, the processing of an incoming get of message for message two and three is not exactly linear. Uh, part of it in the blue box is really core of processing, uh, but there are two, two parts of that where you really have to divert out of, of the core of processing, entering what I imagined as a side processor object uh, ambient, and that happens. Uh, right after the decryption of the message uh, for processing some ED items that you can already at that point for validating the credential and the two things may have to go uh, hand in hand just for the case we have just seen. Uh, and then you get back to Adobe for verifying the message in the signature or the Mac. And, and then in principle, you divert again, for example, to process uh, EID items that can be uh, processed only uh, at that point. And uh, in either case, you may have to produce uh, EAD items to include in the next uh, outgoing uh, ad hoc message. Uh, this figure is not in the draft, happened to be uh, useful together with another one that I have in an offline slide. I promise to include figures as ASCII art in the next version of the draft. So, so Marco, just as a timing check, you're, you're eating into the next presenter's time, but that's you. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> so up to you, no, how, you how you I'm, do I'm, that. I'm, 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 next is just a summary. Um, Thanks for the feedback. It was some plan to add uh, a bit more comment. Um, anyway, I'd appreciate especially feedback and if any big topic is missing here. Thanks. Thank you, Marco. So with my chair hat off, I would just like to comment that we found that we carefully uh, referred to this document during the hackathon and it, it helps us in implementation of uh, in complementing the implementation of uh, the our implementation of ad hoc with a generic handling of EAD items it was very helpful uh, so, and then so this is kind of this maps to a, a chartered milestone so I guess is are we asking for adoption now or what what do we want to do is that now or do you want to do that later or? I was personally planning for the next revision only to add those lines there, which are relatively minor. I don't have in mind any major additional areas to cover myself. Uh, so let's maybe see first how many people have read this draft. Uh, can you raise your hands? Okay, not many, so. Okay. Okay, so it sounds like maybe if you want to do those updates and then we can see if we get feedback on the list and do a call for adoption. But yeah, I mean, it seems like a useful thing, so I don't, I don't expect that to be controversial, but we should do the okay. process. Okay, thanks. Okay, Marco, you're up next. Like that. Yes, um, this is a brand new draft on ad hoc application profiles coordination. <laughs> next slide, please. Um, right, uh, so as a quick recap, um, ad hoc relies on a number of parameters slide, for a successful execution that have to be, uh, to some extent, agreed in advance between the two peers. Uh, some of those can be, uh, can be also negotiated um, in band, but at a high level, the two peers have to agree on an application profile to consider um, for running ad hoc, specifying uh, a number of things, and the main ad hoc document gives uh, already some uh, guidelines. Uh, but we started to think about how we can um, facilitate a number of things uh, and coordinate a number of things related to the use uh, of these um, application profiles. Uh, starting from, from discovery, but then we, we noticed some, some possible work to do also in terms of uh, definition. Um, this also contributes to shaping what I'm quoting here uh, as part of the charter, uh, exactly about uh, this topic. And well, uh, this document is hopefully a starting point. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, um, while working on this, we came up with these uh, four different uh, points that built kind of incrementally. Um, so we started with the, the definition of uh, an identifier that can be assigned to uh, an application profile um, to be referred to uh, in different environments. 
uh, to indicate what application protocols are supported uh, or used, for example. And the second point is, uh, yeah, examples of uh, where those identifiers can be uh, practically used, and we have two already. Um, as a third one, uh, we came up with a possible uh, canonical representation um, in, in CBOR of an application profile in the interest of uh, well, distributing, fetching, storing uh, a description of the profile. Uh, and then that's also part of the sentence in the chart, uh, the, the definition of one or more um, uh, well-known uh, application profiles. Uh, and the meaning of this is not 100% uh, clear at the moment, by the way. Uh, next slide, please. So the first part is really simple. It, it boils down to um, a registry where we can expect to have uh, integer identifiers, possibly with different uh, registration policies and uh, a pointer to the specification that uh, defines uh, the profile. And I don't know if one or more well-known profiles can come already for this, from this document, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So assuming that a registry existing and a few identifiers that can be picked up from there, uh, we talked of two possible examples where uh, they can be used. And this is the, the first one that came uh, to our mind, actually. And I think the trigger was uh, a set of uh, comments uh, from Christian, who a working group was called uh, in a core document, uh, where these sort of ideas, that these possible means uh, came up. Uh, we stopped considering them in, in that document because uh, it was more general than that and more appropriate here uh, somehow. But as a possible use, assuming uh, you have that registry populated with some identifier, uh, here you have an example where you can query the uh, well-known core resource uh, of a co-op server, for example. Uh, you can get back links uh, at that server of, of ad hoc resources. And, and we have in the example two ad hoc resources. Uh, one where uh, the resource is spelling out uh, almost one by one uh, the exact aspect of value that this supports with the related value. Uh, and those attributes are already uh, existing as defined uh, in the core document I, I talked about. But this example is also adding an, an alternative B uh, for the link to another ad hoc resource where, where you just say uh, with this identifier uh, 500 say that, well, that resource supports whatever uh, the profile 500 says. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, staying in, in this example, uh, we wanted to keep things quite simple and, and we, we gave, um, well, uh, a normative guidance in the document that at the moment says basically, don't mix approach A and B in the same link, meaning either you go for spelling out different things uh, like for the link A, uh, or uh, you indicate uh, a profile with identifier, but not both things. So that's where we are right now. It, it can be just fine. We just wondered if uh, it's worth admitting an exception to this for specifying in the same link, both the identifier of the application profile and uh, the list of supported EAD items, just to avoid a potential uh, explosion of registration of so many application profiles that have just minor differences with one another, only with respect to the supported ED items. Um, it's an open point. If that doesn't fly, it can stay strict as is right now. It's OK. Uh, feedback is welcome. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, but another example of use uh, of these uh, application profile identifiers is um, in a descriptive object, the adult information object, uh, defined um, in an ACE draft where basically this sort of object can be used uh, in different situations to describe uh, uh, support uh, by a certain ad hoc peer uh, of ad hoc functionalities and parameters. That draft is already defined in the object. Uh, it's possible used in that context. This document is defining some possible additional entries, and in particular one that I've highlighted in red, where you can specify uh, the integer identifying um, the profile. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't want to mess up with the cutoff deadline and so on, but uh, while section 3.0 is generic and fits well here, I think, on extended that object, section 3.1 uh, is definitely belonging to the other document in ACE because it, it describes how to use uh, these additional parameters there. So it's in this document for now, but the plan is definitely to move it out and to that ACE document where uh, we believe it actually uh, belongs. Next slide, please. And on the third topic, we thought it would be useful to have a canonical representation of an ad hoc application profile to be uh, well, distributed, uh, fetched from a uh, trusted source, uh, stored, and so on. We, we thought of CBOR. And we would like to reuse the same namespace, so to say, and code points from 
um, the same registry defined in the ACE document that I mentioned before, uh, and take the same code points for the sake uh, of the same uh, information in this CBOR uh, data item that we are defining here. And this is basically a simple CDDL definition where I would expect to specify no matter what, only the uh, identifier of the profile itself, uh, again, that integer picked up by the new defined registry, and the methods and credential types. But anything else is just uh, optional and if omitted, nothing should be uh, assumed by default, uh, really. And this has no intention to deviate from what is mandatory to implement uh, and so on. Uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have clear myself uh, really uh, what an application profile uh, must say, uh, can say in general how an exhaustive catalog uh, should look like. Uh, so I welcome feedback on what that the list of possible attributes uh, should cover. Um, but I noticed that the uh, the ad hoc document uh, already suggested that an application profile is supposed to, to tell a number of things, uh, like the, the types of endpoint identifiers and, and the transports to use uh, for ad hoc. Um, so it's clear this sort of information should be around. I don't have clear how it should be represented. Uh, and I just raised some open questions here, so we don't have to answer to them now. Uh, but at some point in that particular data item or more in general, we need to understand how we want to represent these two particular pieces of information and, and if we are missing anything uh, in general. Uh, next slide, please, which is the last point. Uh, yeah, this is an opportunity to consider the definition of one or more, I don't know, uh, well-known profiles and in case they can be registered in, in the uh, profile identifier registry. Uh, we are proposing here. Um, I don't know for sure what a well-known profile should look like. Uh, I can imagine what it should not uh, be about. Uh, so this is not trying by any means to define a, a default profile that deviates or writes any, any mandatory to implement uh, definition uh, in the other profile. Um, is not supposed to be absolutely supported by well-known ad hoc resources and so on. So it, it's not about that. Uh, still is not fully clear to me what it means uh, well known uh, as a first attempt. Uh, it's just an indication of what is expected to be uh, largely supported um, uh, uh, reasonably, uh, reasonably expected to be uh, supported um, and deployed. Uh, but more in general, yeah, what should a well known profile say? Uh, I'd like input on that. Uh, now on the list. Uh, I think on the list. We can think about it, of course. <laughs> uh, next slide. Yeah, that, that's just again a, a list of the four main topics um, for now and a plan for the next version again about uh, moving some contents and taking some step forward already uh, on the definition uh, on some item. And until then, please provide your uh, input. There's a lot of open points here. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Marco. Sure. Do we have any comments on this draft? Yeah, so let's take this to the list and continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next uh, slot is on Greece, presented by Christian. Hello. Um, so yeah, um, I'd like to introduce uh, this draft to this working group. I filed it with Core back before the rechartering, so and forgot to update the name. Uh, going going for with the last iteration. So let's see where this goes anyway. Next slide, please. Um, a few years ago, actually before this working group was chartered, um, uh, esteemed compatriot uh, warned me that ad hoc, even though it's kind of starting small, um, might eventually wind up reinventing a lot of things uh, that TLS is doing. Um, and he was not completely wrong. Uh, the answer that I wish I had back then was that yes, I mean, for some things this will happen, for something, this will be good. And at any rate, a kind of as long as we're mindful of what we take, um, we can also learn from the experience what worked well there. One thing that worked well there uh, is RFC 8702, uh, sorry, one, uh, providing Greece to um, T, uh, TLS extension points. Uh, next slide, please. What this, uh, what this means is that, um, or what, what the, the trouble they ran into was that um, as TLS extension points were not commonly used, 
um, implementations and even middle boxes uh, started relying on the absence of options there. Um, so uh, they provided a few options and let's do that as, as well. So ad hoc has, ex has its extension points um, being EAD items, being cipher suites and others. Uh, so let's make sure that they can be used by making sure that occasionally there is traffic that uh, contains them. Next slide, please. Uh, the concrete thing that the draft currently does is that it registers a few EAD items, uh, one in the in the one plus one range, that is like between two hundred uh, between twenty four and two hundred and fifty six, and two in the range where you would have a, a sixteen bit integer. Um, that are all um, that that are only used in the optional way. So an EAD item can be mandatory to understand or optional to understand, and the way this would be used is optional to understand. So an implementation that provides Greece in a message will add these options, and there is no action to be taken when they are received. And by being optional, that means that a good implementation, that is a non-broken implementation, will just ignore them. And similar for Cypher Suites, there are three, uh, four cipher suites um, registered in the same numeric ranges that might be offered by the initiator at any point in the list that it that it provides. And the requirement there is just that the responder will never select them. So and the responder that doesn't know this document will do this automatically. And the responder that does do this will please not do this because it will be very awkward when both say that, hey, let's do this. And then they find out that, um, yeah, well, um, I actually can't. So. Um, so the semantics are always the same as with many Greece options. Um, if you receive them, just ignore them. But as they are all authenticated, we'll make sure that the ad hoc will already make sure that no one in between is tampering with options. There are two more extension points in, 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 in ad hoc that, that are the methods and the cozy headers that are used. Um, I don't think so. They can't be extended in the same. They can't be greased in the same way because when grease would be applied, then the negotiation would fail. Um, there are ideas of how they could be negotiated, but the question is like, oh, sorry, of how they could be used. But the question is, should they? And my, I'm generally leaning towards no. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a list of like FAQs that I think would be raised um, at some point. Um, one is that like we can't just add stuff because this makes our messages bigger and we want our small messages. So yes, um, this won't be applicable to all connections, but the very constrained ones are those that are better managed anyway. And on the general internet, I mean, there, I hope there will see a lot of uh, ad hoc connections that are like not that constrained and we can just add a bit of that. It will be up to the application also. Uh, another thing is that this can be a covert channel. Um, so we had a comment from the from the interior review um, on, on padding, yes, this can be a covert channel, as can be any EAD option uh, that is unspecified. So I think that's like, yes, be aware of it, but there's nothing much that you can do. And there is one item that is um, that when you do when you do at Greece, then you do this in a particular pattern. So every eight, eighth message or every one hundredth message, and the way you do this reveals something about the implementation you're using. And if you're very careful, you might not want to do this. And this is why the draft contains a suggestion of a pattern how you would apply that based on like random input data. So you could hide in the largest possible anonymity set if everyone does this. Next slide, please. So my next steps here are A, um, there is um, the use it or lose it RFC um, that I'll still have to check uh, for more guidance to pull out of there. There is, um, as I just found out, Today, to my embarrassment, uh, there is an, an IAB um, action going on that is also working on a document um, that describes greasing in a more abstract way and provides good input that may or may not be applicable, we'll see. So that is something that I'll still want to pull in there. But yeah, this in general, this should be an easy document. I mean, it's just a few options with like set them arbitrarily and ignore them when you receive them. So. Yeah, um, I think this should be straightforward. The question is, is this the right place to do it? Thank you. Thanks, and I guess we don't really have time because we're just out, but uh, let's, let's raise this on the list and uh, see what feedback we get. Um, Thank you. So we already have an item in the charter that uh, corresponds to this work. So I guess this is the right place to work on this. 
but yes, let's continue on the list and see where we are, where we end up. Great, thanks. Uh, so I guess the only other thing is what the kind of next steps. And again, we're out of time, so we'll probably send a mail to the list asking people if they want to have like an interim meeting or considering meeting in, in Brisbane in, in the spring or whatever. Um, so we'll, the chairs will send a mail to the list asking for people's preferences about that. And we can figure out whether that's before or after the end of the year on the mailing list, I guess. Um, so I think that's, we're kind of out of time unless somebody has something burning to jump to the microphone about. Don't see it. Okay, so yeah, I think the, um, thanks to the presenters, thanks to their note takers. Uh, there's a couple of drafts that will be turning into adoption calls, hopefully in the not too distant future, and we'll send a poll and so on about an interim meeting, I guess, in the next week or two. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, cool, great. Thank you all, enjoy your dinner. Right on time, just about. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I presume we will probably be more like a early January, kind of January, mid January kind of interim kind of. Mid January. Yeah. I'm assuming, but yeah, that's fine. Should we have a poll or yeah? Yeah, I guess we'll send us. Will we send it? I mean, I can send that in a few minutes, and we can. Okay. Um, I can kind of ask people if there's any preferences, and then we can pick a date. But okay. I'm assuming. Yeah. You think? We're doing before the holidays or not? I don't think anything is burning. Yeah. Um, because we have November, we could have it. Yeah. I mean, you say, yeah, there's time to kind of get something before. Yeah, but...